Hello, hello. <laughs> Got it. <sighs> Welcome. Good to see you all. It's always oh. a good feeling right at this moment <laughs> to mm -hmm. see everybody. Catalina, hey, <laughs> see, you, see you next Saturday, Fred, next Saturday. Fred, hi. Kristen, hi. Ah. Hmm. Huh. Well, those of us on the Big Island, we had a earthquake today, <laughs> 6.1. That was a nice way to think about giving the instructions today about uncertainty and everything moving and changing. <laughs> Intense. I'm say. actually on the East Coast right now, and so I'm a new appreciation for all of you who stick it out this late at night on a Sunday. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Michelle, yeah. whenever you're ready. Ready, okay. <clears throat> Taking um, taking your time, so kind of shifting out of ever um, <clears throat> feeling like you have to be in a hurry to get anything, get rid of anything, even to get relaxed, just kind of shifting out of that kind of way of being. And we're, we're simply kind of taking a few breaths. It's almost like we're running a marathon and then we kind of sit down and get a chance to just be. Going deeper inside. And a lot of the practice is having that sense that it's, it's almost like our body, this is like you think of it as like a car, you kind of just arrive and get in, get in, get in the car, get in the, get inside your body with your awareness. Or if that feels too abrupt, it, sometimes we just are with hearing. So that we're aware of the space around our body, kind of close to our body or with a wide field of hearing awareness. And even just that, the uh, stopping and listening and receiving the textures and vibrations of sound. And it, it, it is this wonderful way to begin a sitting where it's there's this ease, you can find this ease of well being where you're just checking, you're not trying to make anything happen, but checking to see can the attention really receive the silence, the sounds, 
just as they're happening or close to close to close to them happening. And it's often easier to notice the thought, thoughts, any thoughts about the sounds, which is just thinking happening in the present moment. And you notice those thoughts come and go. And then you let the attention kind of settle back to receiving the textures and vibrations directly through the ear door. Or sometimes we can feel the sounds, perceive the sounds in our whole body or parts of our body, sometimes. And we also can learn with the sounds is that sense of not having to do anything with them, which is a kind of solitude, a rest. We're receiving them, noticing them come and go. They're impermanent. But there can be that deep relief of not having to manipulate them or fix them. Or... Think about them. Figure them out. And often that sense of this wide field of awareness, the, when we include the sounds and when we shift to including body sensations, vibrations, textures, there often is an understanding that we also don't have to do anything with the sensations that are appearing anywhere in our body. Again, that solitude, rest, relief. And sometimes again, easier to notice when the thoughts about these sensations appear or stories that we don't have to do anything with those thoughts as well. If you listen very carefully, the thoughts and stories are vibrations and textures. So that sense of outside and inside will start to get less intense. There's just a field of awareness.
we can set the intention to be kind toward whatever appears within this field of awareness. Tender, caring. But also to have this intention to explore and understand rather than to get, get rid of or judge. Sometimes we can let the attention settle in a very small little field like the hands. It's like walking into a just a little teeny pasture. And what kind of relationship do we have with all the many amazing sensations there? That the word hands, our hand, our thumb, palm, could never describe. We might notice the attention flits off. Just let it come back like a butterfly landing on a flower. Very light touch of awareness. Tender. We might sometimes have to let boredom appear. Because the sensations are so refined and light. Boredom can be very interesting. Wanting more to be appearing. Wanting it to be more entertaining. We just let the attention Settle a little deeper. Seeing if we can be interested in the aliveness of our body there. Without any past 
conditioning or ideas. And then if you feel inclined, you shift into another pasture, the belly. Air, earth. And see if you can receive this movement just, just as it's happening or close to. And sometimes stories in the mind or emotions can be so much more interesting. Makes us feel more solid. But when you notice a thought stream end or an emotional fear, happiness, joy, compassion, You open up the attention to the wider field of body sensations. Knowing we don't have to do anything with anything that appears. Whatever appears isn't mine not me or I. And sometimes letting the attention settle back into the movement at your belly or hands sounds. With great care and kindness.
Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, everybody. As I uh, mentioned in the beginning, I'm uh, on the road. I've traveled to New England for a few weeks. It's definitely the, the farthest I've uh, traveled since the COVID era began. It's quite something. I mean, I'm in the place where I grew up, was born. And so, of course, it's always very evocative, you know, to come back, especially after it's been now a couple of years. And it being autumn and you've had a few really beautiful days and a few very cold, gray, drizzly, rainy days as well. So, it, of course, it brings up, a, you know, all kinds of nostalgias and uh, memories and um, yeah, indescribable sense of um, place, you know, wherever you're from, whatever you may feel about that. Uh, there's, there's a deep bond connection there, you know, and so seeing people as well who I haven't seen in a long time and going to places I haven't seen in a long time, it's uh It's on one hand very moving and on the other hand very normal and very familiar and uh, yeah. And the times aren't normal, of course. And I think this sense of um, coming back to normal, you know, from the COVID era, I think is becoming more and more broadly understood if not accepted that that's some part of that is a fantasy a hope um, a hope that's also a nostalgia at the same time and perhaps fading into uh, the whatever mental emotional space that's less and less likely you know think of course the summer feeling there's more positive change happening and then um, you know, things, the numbers getting harder in a lot of places. And, uh, and then, of course, it's just part of it, I think, the good New England bracing bitterness to prepare for winter <laughs> that I think people are very good at here in order to, to make it through. And so there's, there is, uh, I feel like a, a sense not just here, of course, with everyone, you know, that I encounter and and experience in myself, uh, this poignancy uh, around losing some sense of stability that we may have formed around hope, through hope about the future. And a sense deep in many or subtle in many, uh, but but perhaps broad at this point in terms of how it's shared of of a sense of kind of grimness about the future, right? Of COVID or the climate or politics and divisiveness and all of the things that we all know about. And what a powerful sense of loss so many people feel in the loss of hope and how um, amazing that is and what a what a fascinating thing to consider and um, And what does that mean for each of us? And what does it mean in our practice and our spiritual lives? What is the place of hope? What is the 
place of despair or fear? And what are the relationships between these things? Because it's so often formulated as a kind of binary, right? That I I had written something about the word despair a few days ago. And you know, sometimes when you look at a word for long enough and it doesn't, like, you're not sure that that's real. It doesn't, it's not it's just looking weird, right? Like you're like, I don't know if I spelled that right. <laughs> and so I had to look up despair and make sure I was actually spelling it right. And it, it's the one definition said the, the, the utter loss of hope, right? So this, this idea that these, these two things are on this kind of spectrum. And then if you're, you're either sort of on more or one side uh, of the other, I don't know if that just made sense but you see what I'm saying. <laughs> the, the fear, it's like the loss of hope is not just um, a pain and that loss, but it's a fear of the despair, right? The fear of, um, of, of sliding on to the other end of that spectrum into a place of, of what might be often considered hopelessness. And so, I think I just wanted to offer a little bit of, of a plug for hopelessness and the, the beauty and the, the value of that for our spiritual lives. Well, the primary reason I came here, um, my niece invited me to officiate her wedding, which happened this past weekend. And you can see in so many, you know, of course, in uh, she and her husband and the family, of, especially in these times, the sense of a, a young couple getting married and the, the, the hope that that inspires in people right down the road and children and, and all and grandchildren <laughs> and all of the, um, uh, the, the things that people hope they have to look forward in terms of that union that coming together and of course how human that is right and how how beautiful that can be in the the cycle of life and of course in my role i have a there's something about a wedding or these rites of passage that are like a a little bit of the stamp of samsara on them right so it's a it's a complicated position to be in and of course i didn't have my speech be encouraging great hopelessness on the part of all but because uh, it's not necessary and i think there's ultimately the message is, is still the same that that there's something much deeper than hope and hopelessness, hope and despair, hope and fear. That um, that ultimately it is in the ending of hope that we also find the end of despair, and that the relationship between those things is not at all like we fear or imagine them to be a lot of the time. Because hope ultimately, I mean, there are of course different flavors of it. Um, but in the end, it's mostly wanting, right? It really is, when it comes down to it, it is still an, a, a, a pressure of expectation, of future satisfaction, of some, some level of sense experience of, of you know, body or, or mind or conceptual satisfaction that things will turn out, things will be better. Um, and so there is, uh, on some very, even though we, we often will assert the sort of sacredness of hope, right? And this kind of give it a sense of a holy quality because we don't usually talk about it in those terms. Like we don't, you know, hope for ice cream, right? Or hope for satisfaction. It usually is in reference to things that are perhaps more profound and more meaningful. Um, but in the end, on a very basic level, there is something that is not different than simply longing, simply wanting things to be the way we want them to be in the future.
and again, of course, it's it's completely understandable and and some of these hopes are entirely beautiful right then there there's hopes for humanity or hopes for the world or hopes for uh, a new couple or hopes for a child you know it's a very important place to also get how the caution around craving is not a judgment, right? That if we see it in along these lines, it's like, oh, how could you, it's not about judging the idea that we want things to be better, right? Want things to be better for ourselves or for others. But it's understanding the mechanics of suffering, the mechanics of dukkha that come through misunderstanding. And what is it to release the future from the pressure of our longings, the pressure of our fantasy needs right um the pressure of our fear and what a relief that actually can bring into the present moment how much more access it gives to peace of mind to tranquility and to things like love and compassion that the the flow of them the openness towards care towards kindness towards generosity towards all these beautiful factors of heart aren't dependent upon expectation of a certain outcome they're liberated from hope and of course how hard it is and what a beautiful process it is to come to understand these things and come to understand the the pain of hopefulness right the pain of wanting things to be one way or another but also that it can the part of the solution comes from recognizing that it can come from such a beautiful place right it can really come from love that feels threatened that, do, that feels fragile that doesn't feel strong enough it doesn't feel confident enough and so there's the fear and there's the longing and the grasping of, of expectation. But when we can feel the pain of that hopefulness, feel the truth of its wanting nature and are able to relax and let go, then there's something um, so profound that's offered to us that we have access to that is really kept from us if we are fixated on a certain thing or afraid of another thing. I'm supposed to teach a day-long retreat next uh, Saturday here. It'll be the first time teaching in person uh, for me in quite a while. And it's an outdoor uh, situation. And so, um, I'm very, you know, excited and looking forward to it. And, um, and of course, I hope it's a nice day, you know. And right now, it's not looking too good in terms of some of the weather, you know. At least it might be a little warm, but it looks like it might be a little rainy. And we have a pavilion. The folks have at the um, Western Mass Insight here of, you know, uh, got it really set up well so far. So we'll, we're, we're going to do our best. And, um, and yet just how amazing it is, you know, just to see every day checking, checking, checking the weather, like, is it going to be this, is it going to be that, how do we prepare? And of course, like, wonderful, you know, to see um, people, you know, planning for this or planning for that. And, you know, out of goodness, out of wanting people to be cared for, wanting people to have the conditions that are supportive for their practice and supportive for gathering and community and safety in terms of COVID. And, um, that we do what we can, but also it's like when we relax that tension, that tightness, there's also a beauty in that, right? The sense of like, well, do you okay, whatever, you know, if it's raining, if it's cold, if it's sunny, if it's whatever, you know, the, the mind and the practice, the Dhamma is so strong. It's the deepest faith, right? that the mind 
all of our minds, the mind, no mind, you know, nobody's minds. These, the, the heart has the ability to be okay, no matter what's happening. And of course, as all of us know as yogis, that there are times where, you know, sometimes more adverse conditions can inspire um, some really beautiful insights and capacities of the mind. Of course, you know, I also want to acknowledge that there are aspects of hope that are much more existential, you know, that for any of us in our lives. You know, hope that things go well in terms of our ability to provide for ourselves or our family, to our ability to survive, you know. Um, again, to be careful to not judge hope as something neurotic, you know, or minimize the, the real value it can have in terms of motivation, in terms of getting through a hard time. I think there are studies done about, you know, people who are hopeful live longer, you know, or have better chances at, you know, recovery from certain conditions or, or what have you. You know, there is something very, it's a very powerful tool to be able to anchor the attention, you know, anchor the, the mind in a fabricated future moment. And, and to kind of draw yourself forward with the force of that, you know, it's not to be dismissed and it's not to be disregarded. And, and it may be a tool uh, of the mind, of the heart that, that comes in very useful at times for us. But it's important to recognize it also as that, you know, as a tool, as, as a, a technique that we can at times um, use or, you know, fall back on or, or just observe because it's going to naturally arise, you know. I, I really want to make sure that sometimes you give a talk and someone will quote back to you what they thought was said in the future and it's like, disturbing. I don't want anyone to think that I'm trying to say you need to get rid of hope, right? Or that you need to like, just like crush it or that hope is wrong and hope is bad. It's like, well, Jesse said, it's like, it's a problem, you know? And it's like, no, the idea is it's like when you feel that, right? When we do long for something, when we have a hope or we have the pain of our hope to being deflated, that we just take that moment to, to settle into the feeling, right? That we, we use it as an opportunity to strengthen the heart and mind, to understand that there is something that the mind is trying to avoid most of the time, right? The sense of there's a pain about what's happening right now. There's a fear about what might be happening in the future. There's a, a wound about something that's happened in the past and that the hope is being used by the mind to kind of overcome that and override it and and not have to notice it but also not sink into it not drown in the fear or in the pain or in the unpleasant experience that we're going through and so it's like if that's a very powerful tool it's not to say we rip it away from ourselves or give ourselves a hard time about oh you're so hopeful you know like how could you uh it's like no you just watch you know you watch the sense of wanting things to be a certain way wanting things to work out for yourself or for others and trying to see that trying to feel the pain of that and the beauty of that trying to understand the place of care that it might be coming from the place of worry that it might be coming from to understand it and to see how the heart actually can be strong enough to be in that without needing to put pressure on the future or run from the past we have the ability to feel the wanting to feel the grief to feel the sadness to feel the care and to have that love or have the care about others expand, strengthen, uh, flourish, blossom in the present moment, right? Not just in, a, in an imagined future moment. 
and actually how settling that can be, what a relief that can be, how beautiful that can be. Because there is something about, it's like when you, you really start to see all the many flavors and degrees and spectrums of hopes that we have for, you know, for ourselves, for the others, for the world, and find the breathing room right of not always having to buy into it not always having to feel we're in that sort of strained place around the future of coming to relax in the present experience of the body of the mind of the sense doors that there's a relief and that there's also a a sense that love is the only reasonable thing to feel right that like caring for all of us and everything and everyone uh, is such a relief to the heart, to the mind in that moment. Understanding this dynamic reality between ourselves and the world, between ourselves and all that we sort of project our hopes and fears and longings out to externally as well. And the way that metta has the ability to um, not just ability, maybe the tendency to break down those distinctions, right? The the idea that just the, that love doesn't need to move in one direction or another ultimately, right? That it can be pervasive and there's an abiding quality in it, and how it has the this this quality of truth and 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 reason just like. I always use the word reasonableness or rationalness, but the sense of it's the only reasonable thing to feel, right? And what a beautiful thing to come from letting go of hope, right? To see that it's the end of hope that is also the end of despair. And it's the clinging to hope, the building up of hope that is the source of despair, right? The root of despair, the root of anxiety, of grief. Where we place ourselves in relationship to the past and future is of so much consequence, you know? This um, one thing I noticed that we have here and I don't have so much at home in Hawaii is rivers, streams, you know, you all over, you know, big ones, the Connecticut River is quite close here and lots of little streams, you know, driving through the hill towns and just this understanding. And it was something that did uh, that I was moved to share in terms of the the wedding itself of and it's something I've said in this this field before of like this place where these two streams come together is so sacred in so many um, traditions, so many cultures. And that our practice is in some ways this acknowledgement of where these streams of sense experience and mind and body all come together. And how powerful and dynamic and overwhelming that can be and that, of course, we, we try to control it, we try to manage it, we try to um, manipulate the downstream of what's going to happen. For these streams, for the streams around us and in life and the world, and how impossible that is, you know. But that doesn't mean that our lack of control means we don't have we have some kind of lack of responsibility. And that's what's so difficult ultimately, I think in terms of our lives and this practice of, of recognizing that we have no control and we have total responsibility for what happens downstream. We have total responsibility for our part in what happens downstream. And so this sense of where is anger or craving or tightness and tension and fear 
the force that we create at this coming together of these streams and where is their wisdom where is their understanding where is their insight where is their kindness and generosity compassion joy and even though that doesn't mean we we're able to control anything that happens downstream from us in the future from this present moment it still matters right it still does matter that what we're contributing is of one the one quality or another we know it matters you know there's not doesn't take a complicated uh, mathematics to understand that but it doesn't mean that we can control it <sighs> One of the, in our lineage, like cardinal sins of teaching is to put a song in a yogi's head, um, especially if they're on retreat. Um, so I've, I've really never, I don't think I've ever really done this, but I, I don't, I have a, I'm guessing that actually no one maybe knows this song um, or very few here in this group. So I'm gonna read it as a poem because we do read poems all the time. Um, I just heard this uh, recently and it moved me and I, I, I think there's something very powerful in it. It's um, by Noah Cyrus, the end of everything. She's like, for anyone who knows about pop music, she's like the young sister of Miley Cyrus. Uh, like whatever, super famous, she's like 20. She wrote it. Everyone you know, everyone you love is going to die. But darling, so is everything, so don't cry. The stars will blink out one by one in time. And everyone you love is going to die. Everything you fear is gonna end. All your hate and hurt lost to the wind. And it's hard, I know, the universe can be a jealous friend, but everything you fear is gonna end. And there may not be a sadder thing than watching Saturn lose her rings and black holes slowly dancing in the dark. It's a song that they were born to sing about the end of everything until it all goes up in one last spark. Everyone you love is going to die but so is everything, so wipe your eyes. You know nothing lasts forever, but Lord, we try. Everyone you love is gonna die. All the saints and sinners are the same. We're blessed, then we obliterate. And that's how it was written from the start. It's a song that we were born to sing about the end of everything until it all goes up in one last spark. Everyone you love is gonna die. So don't you let the moment pass you by. And man, there really ain't no sadder thing. There really ain't no sweeter thing. And I think there is something so purely true about that, that sense of the beauty of the fragility of anicca, dukkha, anatta, of the hopelessness that really is at the heart of reality and of existence and how sad and how painful and difficult that is for us, of course, and how it is the key rather than fighting it and wrestling with it and avoiding it that the acceptance of it and the truth of it, if we really let it penetrate, is also the key to all of the purest sweetness and care and kindness and liberation of the heart that's possible. And so I do think that this time in the world and of course this season is such a important time to practice this letting go 
practice this um, embracing of warm embrace of hopelessness and the letting go of that and the relief from the pain of that and the relief from despair that's possible. So we do have some time uh, for questions. Uh, if you're, for your practice or the instructions or this talk or anything that um, questions you might have that Michelle and I might be able to support you with. Just as usual, the little reactions button at the bottom of the screen, you can click on that and click raise hand and we'll get a sense that you're in the queue. Um, if that doesn't work or whatever, you can always just type into the chat there uh, that you have a question and we'll make sure to call on you. Hi, Kristen. Oh, hold on, I need to click on this so you can unmute. I think you can unmute yourself now. Hi, thank you for the meditation and for your talk today. Um, I'm, I know that hope has a bad rap in Buddhism and I'm wondering if the word needs to be rehabilitated. Uh, I remember Thich Nhat Hanh saying that the word love needs to be rehabilitated. Uh, so I'm not sure we need to move toward hopelessness, but rather move to the kind of hope that um, Evan Thompson uh, talks about as a as an orientation to the good and as um, and the opposite of despair, an open spaciousness in the midst of uncertainty. So he, he differentiates between wise hope and unconditional hope. So I'm wondering about your thoughts on that. Yeah. I. I mean, I'd have to read. It's Evan Thompson, you said? Yeah, I mean, it'd be interesting to read more. I mean, I think an open spaciousness, an orientation toward good and an open spaciousness, what did you say, toward uh, everything? It's the opposite of despair and an open spaciousness in the midst of uncertainty and change. Yeah. I mean, I think I definitely believe in an open spaciousness towards hope and, and or towards uncertainty, you know, and I don't think that's hope. <laughs> you know, I mean, I think it's like if if you're not, if hope, if you're not talking about wanting a certain future outcome, then I'd say that's deeper than a rehabilitation. That's like a re, uh, that's a re recreation of the word. And the Buddha did that a lot. I mean, so it's not, it would not be out of, out of place to do something like that, where it's like, or, 
you know, like instead of karma, karma, he would, you know, there's often it was considered action. And at some point he said, when I say karma, I mean intention, right? So, so I think language is such a, a powerful and complicated thing to try to change or to re-understand. And, and, and so I think also even the, even I think what I'm, in some ways what I'm trying to say is, can we rehabilitate the word hopelessness so that it isn't meaning despair, but it's meaning a letting go of expectation of the future, which is what I tend to think of uh, in terms of hope. And so I think, you know, we can play around with the words and I think um, it might not really matter ultimately too much, but I am always curious about even my own. And I think in general, we should be curious about why we're resistant to letting go of the word hope or of the notion of hope. And, um, and does it really take totally changing the meaning of it in order to feel like it's, it can fit into our um, framework? I don't know. I think it's a good question. Michelle? Mm. What a great discussion. Mm. I, I have a lot of different directions I feel like I could go with this and I think it's um, hard to choose. I, I, I think that um, usually we don't, uh struggle with with this if if there isn't a lot of pain happening and so i think just to name that that often it's when um we actually can't be with something very painful um that i think the missing the missing um, experience that we, we don't attend to first is disappointment. So I, I think there's an underlying experience that often a lot of us um, have a hard time naming, which is that when there's a kind of crushing kind of pain going on, um, I think we often jump to hope because we don't want to feel disappointment. Uh, in in how life can be, um, so I, I guess that's the first thing that I think is important to untangle in all of us. Like I de I'm dealing with a pretty intense chronic pain, and sometimes it gets a little less, and then I'll have this hope <laughs> that oh, it's going to go away, right? And yet there's this other part of me that's going, you know. Uh, you know, this would be this kind of expectation is really actually um, not helpful. And that actually what's helpful is when there can be an unconditional acceptance of how it is without the despair. So, I, you know, just that pure equanimity, which actually a couple of times ago when you asked a question, I felt that you were really describing that pure equanimity really well, that um, is that, you know, the, and you asked, is this okay? I don't know if you remember that, but you, you know, it's like, I just love that because I'm like, is this okay? <laughs> you know, it's like, is pure unconditional acceptance okay? Yeah, it's like so okay, but it's often, um, I think it's very, other than all of this. And I, I think that any way that we can reframe or redefine or re-explain um, uh, these actually very deep um, human ways that we get through hardship are, are really important and a hard to untangle. Um, so before I stop, because I know I can go on <laughs> and on, um, there's another whole part of this that I think is very important. 
which so th there's that unconditional acceptance of sometimes like a crushing kind of pain whether it's large you know or small or just personal or global um I find it very hard to language this, but there is the, like if you had a, a three-year-old or a four-year-old that's asking about hope, I think that's very, very different than uh, someone older. And I, I think that's like, we all have a young part of us, a very young part of us that I think sometimes when we talk about hope that there, the idea of kind of seeing something beyond it kind of crushes that childlike part of us. And I think that's really dangerous and important to consider. Uh, so if you have a little kid that's like trying to understand some kind of massive pain, again, whether it's outer or inner in the family or down the street, um, what what do you do? What do you do for a little kid? Well, you do meta, meta, met. You pick this kid up and you you comfort the child, and you don't say there's no hope, <laughs> right? You know, you, you just say um, you just say it's it's you you say it's okay, even though um, what you're what I know for me for myself with this aspect of all of us or with a young kid I'm saying it's okay right now it's okay right now I'm not saying it's going to be okay five years from now but in that moment that deep reassurance of the compassion the loving kindness is so important um, and so I think what I'm trying to say is that these these younger parts of us that need the massive reassurance that isn't necessarily infused with wisdom um, sometimes gets entangled with the old, the wisdom part of us that um, the wisdom is the reassurance. And in these deeper places of unconditional acceptance, there's no movement of mind to the past or future there just is no need for it there's no there's no um that peace that peace with how things are is um the hope and hopelessness all of that um are words and they they don't they don't they don't have to um they're not necessary really Um, if I could just say, yeah, that's, <clears throat> that's my long answer. <laughs> um, personally, I think just like there's conditional love and unconditional love, mm -hmm. there's conditional hope, which oh, is kind of right. expectation, right? Yeah, and unconditional yeah. hope, which is a kind of spacious openness. And just speaking as someone who's felt a lot of hopelessness in my life, um, I don't find the, the idea of hopelessness um, very inspiring, but I find the, the sense of uh, unconditional hope to be uh, inspiring, that orientation to the good, and um, that um, you know, spacious openness. I mean, I know it's a matter of words, but it's also not. I mean, it's more than that, as I say, just like conditional love and unconditional right. love. I think it's a matter of understanding. Wise, wise hope. Yeah, wise understanding, yeah. And then how we would define wise hope, I think um, that might be very uh, individual and uh, any way that one tries to attempt to define this um, with more and more understanding, I think is really important. <laughs> you know, like, uh, just like with the word love, as we're talking about love is, uh, if you asked 
ask Jesse or I to describe the word love as we understand it, it would be a one year one year course, right? So I think like with the with this discussion, I think uh, it could be a one year exploration. <laughs> really, like I think it's important. That's what I'm trying to say. Is I think it's really important. And grateful that you brought it up because I think it's, you know, um, I think sometimes our minds can resist both words. I think both words, <laughs> hope and hopelessness, they're like, I can just feel part of me goes, oh, <laughs> oh not that, right? Because it requires so much effort to like re understand it from a wise place. I think I just what I just want to make sure doesn't get lost in <laughs> is, is that when I say hopelessness and I can understand, of course, how that is going to be evocative of despair, but that it's sort of the exact opposite of what I'm trying to say, which is to say like the lack of hope that that hope and despair as they are commonly understood are actually commonly misunderstood and that they are dependent upon one another and are actually part of the same process. And that there is something actually outside of that that is a liberation of it, that is a liberation from both hope and despair. And and it requires letting go of both. Um, and I think it's true that the process of disenchantment that is part of the Dhamma way is, is often not inspiring, but it's, it's not supposed to be like drowning either. And so I think that that is a very, the language matters, of course. And so to, you know, to the degree it doesn't work, it's like definitely don't, don't use it, but also to be careful about, I think my concern about letting, using trying to reframe hope as something that has nothing to do with what we commonly understand hope to mean is the danger in that is not having a word to talk about the thing that we do generally mean about hope, which is an attachment to a future experience. And so that would be the concern, right? Is just to be like, if, if we're just trying, if we lose a connection to be able to investigate this part of the heart's action, Right, which is uh, what we we often think as a as a wholesome longing for a future state, um, and that we don't have a word then to describe that, because now hope means something else. That we are also losing an ability to investigate something very common and shared among humans um, that is it that in that does feel important to keep exploring so i think it's a great you know uh question and investigation and 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 i think uh i want to read more of i'll check out evan thompson and i think julia put a thing in here uh about a talk it looks like maybe you can find it online uh, that he gave at the mind life institute speaker series so i think it'll be cool to check out Thank you, Kristen. Thank you. Thank mm. you. Mm. Tisha, Bonnie. Hi. Um, thank you for just an amazing um, discussion. Um, I've been contemplating uh, hope and hopelessness in relation to uh, my experience with my son uh, living on the streets and using intravenous drugs for years. And I felt like I was holding hope right alongside hopelessness. And, and, and love was the thing that had to, that actually was holding it. Because if I had, like you were saying, the kind of hope that has a, an attachment to a particular outcome, then I couldn't really love him as he is. I, ha I should probably say was because he did die. But um, so I had to have them both to hold them together. And, and it was the, the love that allowed me to be able 
when I could to do that. So I really appreciate that you're bringing up this um, challenging topic. Thank you for sharing that. It's so powerful, beautiful, and like shared, right, by so many of us. <laughs> like whoever that person is in our lives or people are in our lives or family, it's, um, it's such a good example of the conundrum of the heart of love and disappointment and fear and everything. And so I just really, I appreciate the, the offering and the, and the, and I, and that particular thing of like, we also know it's the let, let the, where is the letting go of the contraction of hope, not cynicism either, that doesn't let the sense that people can change and there is possibility for everyone's life to change for the better. And then we know that that's possible and we know how hard it is and how up against so much so many of us are in terms of our ability to find our way through it. Um, and so I do, I, I think that what do we call that uh, space of possibility, right? And, and not closing off the heart's knowing of what might be possible or opening to what may be possible. Uh, maybe that is a little bit um, uh, of what we were just talking about with the sort of, like, I, have, I don't have the language, right? But the orientation towards the good or the sort of unconditional um, spaciousness. Um, that's so important. Yeah. Yeah, Michelle. Yeah, Thank you. I, I, I think the first Brahma Vihara, the loving kindness, the metta is um, just to refresh all of our understanding of that, that it has nothing to do with behavior. Nothing. And we tend to want to jump to other Brahma Viharas or to this or that, but just to just the bottom line is is that it has nothing to do with our behavior or anybody's behavior. And so that's what you're talking about. And really, really important. Just um, so, you know, it's the words are so it is very hard to talk about all this stuff, but there is that sense of um, as a mother <laughs> and the karma of that with a, a newborn, you know, it's like that's the, the Buddha described metta as that moment that the mother cow looks at the newborn calf and that, that just, just that well wishing, right? That well wishing, but knowing that all the vicissitudes of life will happen, all, you know, you can't control a child's karma <laughs> you can you can you can do everything you can but then it's like with a, we all know it with, just with ourselves like there are behaviors that we, <laughs> we we have to forgive right never mind others so um this is so important again when we talk about um goodness in relationship to a new definition, even of hope, it's like um, meta is that it's it, we don't call meta hope, but meta is tuning in to the goodness of all beings, no matter what the behavior is. That's like one on one meta, you know, and it, it includes to me a you know like that idea of the open spaciousness. But it's like really what we're offering is that you uh, you're born here we're all born here and we live out the karma of that and um, there's a deep goodness in all that is alive that has nothing to do with behavior and you could maybe call that hope to me it's like that what else could that be 
Of course, here in New England, so the words of Emily Dickinson come to mind in that poem where she says, uh, I dwell in possibility. And I think there's something really in that, you know, around, um, just around maybe perhaps some solution or answer to this conundrum that we all face. Of course, you know, and how we interpret that is so dependent on our own makeup, you know, the dwelling in possibility for one person might be the candy store of what might be possible. And for another person, right, like all of the, <laughs> the calamities that might be possible or whatever, you know. And so I think that like, there's no perfect language around it. But I, there are these moments where you can get a sense of how the heart manages to find its way through um, all of the possibility and, and joy and sorrow in it. Oh, Quinn, do you have a question? Or, yeah, hold on. Great. I just have a very short comment that um, when you talk about hope, usually you talk about the future, but I dwell in the present moment. Does it mean that I don't need hope? <laughs> How do you feel about, I mean, do you feel Okay, let's say I, I have, I'm a caregiver. And for me, looking in the future, there's no hope. Absolutely no hope. So all I have is this present moment. And how does it feel? Does it, does it mean that I'm hopeless? <laughs> I think it does in a wonderful way. <laughs> I mean, but how does it feel? I mean, what the, the ultimately it's like what we call it. It's like, what's your experience of it? I mean, do you feel oh, like it's liberating? Hmm. If I can stay in that present moment. Yeah. Can I, I would like to just say that this really gets to the heart of all of our action and our behavior, which is um, if our behavior is motivated by, in your case, the direction of the person you're caring for is getting better and you're making all that effort, but the motivation is for it to get better and better, um, I think, and if we called that hope, that would be, I think that would lead to more and more despair. Um, and so I think for us, a lot of that, like understanding of how love and love and wisdom, like unconditional love and wisdom, when they integrate, one starts to question one's motivation with any, all of our action. And that when we're motivated by, um, when the effort is going into more and more um, trying to control the result of the action, right? Then we, we get burnt out, especially with, you know, most get difficult situations. Um, but if one, this is where I think it's like to just, we're always kind of hopefully kind of at times assessing the motivation and assessing the motivation. And if the motivation is to purely care, right? To care unconditionally, then that feels good and it's energizing because it has nothing to do with the result. Right. 
And that's what's so liberating. You know, and that's what's so beautiful. Because you know the love is pure. Just the, the compassion's pure. It has nothing to do with the result. Um, but boy, sometimes that's really hard when you're tired. <laughs> yeah. Talk about compassion fatigue. Yeah, it's really hard. Yeah. And I, I just want to say, too, that it's like it doesn't mean that we're also, that it's always just joy and metta, right? That It's really hard. There, yeah, the, it's a, you're we're more vulnerable to the pain that that in some ways by letting go of the future experience there is a deep or some future you know aspiration there is a deeper heart connection to the suffering of somebody or ourselves or whatever you know there's a vulnerability it requires a very profound vulnerability that's that's like of course we're running from that of course we don't want to feel that. And so we hope for something else or we go to nostalgic for a pastime or whatever. And so it's like to understand that sometimes the heart needs the protection of hope, needs a protection of despair or or of, of hopelessness in the negative sense, right? Or of, of, of abandoning or giving up on, or like there's some times where, where it really feels like the heart is not capable of being so vulnerable. And that those times we have to be compassionate to our own hearts and caring for the, the wall that needs to come down and the sense of like, it's hit a limit that the, you know, the fuses have blown and it's like, okay, you rest, you take your time as best as you can. Or if you're in a, in a context in which you have to keep engaging or caretaking or dealing with, you know, something very difficult, you're not trying to force metta or force all the wisdom or whatever, but you have to get that, like, oh, your heart is doing it from a protected place. You're a right. little detached. It's a little bit numb and that that's, it's okay. The yeah. action still matters. Um, and, yeah. you know, you go through it, how you're doing it. Yeah. yeah. You just have to accept def defeat sometimes. Surrender. Yay. Thank you. Oh, Michelle, you're muted there. I did myself. I think it's so beautiful, this discussion, because, um, you know, it's like that reminder, Jesse said it in his talk, but it's like, when I feel like I'm, you know, whatever's happening, but if I'm hoping that um, <laughs> the wind stops, because I've had, where I live, I've been having 55 mile per hour winds for days and days and days. Like it's... <laughs> This morning, I my my little eyelid went. <laughs> it's like, and I woke up and I was like, I really hope the wind like stops today, right? Like, of course I want the wind to stop. You know, I mean, come on, like it's like we of course we want the pain to stop, or we want the we want of course, like Jesse said, of course he of course he wants it to be sunny on the day long and the end of October in New England. You know, I mean, of course, but um. This is what's, this is how we offer the teachings that you say, of course, and then you come back to this place of like, yeah, but can't control it, right? But it, that there is a, um, like, it's not the cynical or sadistic or negative uh, meaning to that acceptance. It's, it's just that beautiful, like how things are. Let's see how it goes. Like, but the beautiful how things are. Let's see how it goes. Yeah, it's just that's just it, you know. <laughs> I mean, when I heard this song, right, it's like, here's this 20 year old woman wrote this, you know, sat down and wrote the song about how everyone you know is going to die and like, and how, how, how beautiful that, um, that truth, the beauty that the heart can have access to, you know, from that truth, it's like, I was like, maybe there's hope for this generation. <laughs> it's like, no. Hope is very seductive. Of, of course, we want them to have as much goodness as they can. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
Mm. But we don't know. Meta, 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 meta. Thank you all. Hope to see you next Sunday. <laughs> yes, the big hope. <laughs>